Oh, I'm, I'm almost, I'm probably three-fourths. I, I like it. Did they really? Okay, we need to get started since we're already five minutes late. We're late all the time here. So I'm going to read just a little bit from uh, Psalm 89 as we get started. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known throughout, through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself, and jumping over a few verses, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They exult in your righteousness, for you are their glory and strength, and by your favor you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Father, we thank you this morning that we can be in your house. We thank you that we can worship your name, O oh God. And Lord, we just remind ourselves once again, it's not what happens up here in front that counts, it's what happens when you are working and speaking to each heart of each person that is here today. That's what really matters. That's what really counts here, Lord. So we just want to say, Lord, this time is all about you. We're here to worship you. We're here to give ourselves to you for this time this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Is this on? Does it sound like it's on? Does it really? Okay. Sometimes in church, you got to make... you got uh, kind of make plans on the fly. And Denise was going to be leading us in music this morning, and Denise is really sick. And there's a lot of that stuff going around. So we had to make, Cal and I had to make some very last-minute uh, adjustments. So I need you to stand, if you would. There should be song sheets, unless the rascals in first service took them, that have some words to the songs. We're going to sing two songs that there's no lyrics up on the screen. But they're real simple, and you'll know them, and they're energetic, and I hope you put yourself into them. Let's do it. Cal, let's roll it. Come to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. And give him praise. Come to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Thanksgiving in your heart, your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Give glory and honor and power unto Him. Jesus, the name above all names. Come into His presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give Him praise. And give Him praise. Come to His presence. In your heart, your voice is great, your voice is great, in glory.
Amen. This next song, just translate back about 20 years. I was going to grow a mullet to go with this song, but I didn't have time. But I want you to seriously, I want you on a, on a more serious note, I want you to stop and think for a minute, how has God been good to you recently? We're going to sing about the Lord's goodness this morning, and just think about God's goodness to you. Go ahead, Cal. Think about how good God is to us. I like the song that says his, his mercies are new every morning. He's faithful. He doesn't give us yesterday's blessings. No, he has brand new blessings for us each and every day. God has been good to me. I thank him for my wife and my children. I thank him for my church and, and the people that love me and and care and help me. Lord, I thank you for your salvation. I thank you so much, Lord, that I'm saved tonight. Thank you, Lord. In spite of myself, Lord, you saved me. It was your goodness that called me to repentance. Oh, I love you, Lord. We love you. 
love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Sing it down. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. thank you that you've been good to us better than we deserve Lord we thank you for your goodness today thank you for your goodness that we can even be in your house today and worship freely and praise your name in your name we pray amen you can be seated I want to get the lights for us good morning we're glad to see <coughs> excuse me See each one of you this morning. Um, just a few announcements. Um, <clears throat> if you're a visitor here with us um, and you've uh, received uh, this bulletin, there is a tear-off portion right here that we'd love for you to fill out with your name and um, just some general information. Also, if you have a praise or a prayer request, please put those on the back. We love to uh, read your praises, and we pray for your prayer requests every week. Um, that is one thing we do as a staff. They get prayed for at staff meeting, but they also get prayed for during other times of the week, too. And uh, that's a privilege to be able to pray for you and for um, the needs of, of this church. And... Um, also, we have a special visit. Well, he's not a visitor. He arrived into this earth on the 23rd of December, and he is here today. And he decided that it's okay that he brings his mommy and daddy with him. So he's going to come. Well, Howie and Sarah, you don't get to sit back there. You're his parents. So you need to come forward along with Cheney, but Pastor Brian has him. And today, other than pictures, was the first day I actually got to really lay eyes on him. So he is quite the cutie, and being in church doesn't seem to be bothering him a bit. Yeah. But anyway... Come forward, Mom and Dad. You get to stand up here and enjoy everybody looking at your beautiful son. Isn't, isn't he a cutie? Yeah. But he is a sweetheart, and um, Sarah will take um, any kind of babysitting, especially at 1.30 in the morning, because that's what I heard he really likes to play. So she'll, she'll take any, type, any kind of child care like that. So anyway, we just wanted to bring him forward, and what a sweetheart he is. And anyway, thank you for sharing him with us. So... 
we uh, were, had concert of prayer scheduled this week, but we are delaying it till next week. So um, if you, as Pastor Ryan put it in first service, if you do come tonight for concert of prayer, we do hope you have a key to get into the front door or you're going to be awfully cold in the parking lot. So, uh, but it's just delayed one week um, for next week. So that gives you something to put on your calendar and look forward to it. Concert of Prayer is a, uh, a really neat time of just coming and praying as a congregation. And um, anyway, it's just, uh, it's just really special because we not only pray for our church, but we pray for our community and our government and our missionaries and just, uh, uh, you know, around the world. So it's, it's a neat, and we also get to pray for the people that we have put on our board um, that we'd like to see come to uh, have Jesus in their heart. And if the ushers would please come forward, we'll take our tithes and offerings. Remember, on Thursday night from 7 to 8.30, there is youth group here at the church. We'll bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today, and uh, Lord, we just thank you for your many blessings that you pour into our lives, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we give back just a portion of what you give to us, Lord, may we use it to further your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just uh, love you and thank you how you provide for us in your name. Amen. Ushers, take the offering, sing with me.
Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Will you stop and think just for a minute how good God has been to you? For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. Isn't that true, folks? Just stop and thank him and declare his greatness today. Great is the Lord and most worthy of all praise. Father, we declare your greatness today. I don't know that you really need us to do it, but we need to do it on our behalf. On our end, we declare again the greatness of God. And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. Because you've been good to us. And Lord, it's, you're great even if things are hard for us. Even when things go wrong, that doesn't change who you are, oh God. You're still good. Sometimes we live in a broken, sinful world and things go wrong. But God is always good. And he, you are always great, O oh God. And you extended mercy to us by coming and dying on the cross. And Lord, I, I, I know I've said this so many times, the thought just keeps reoccurring in my mind. If you never showed me another ounce of mercy besides the cross, that would have been enough. That's all the mercy that I needed. That's all we needed to save our souls. And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives. And we thank you for your unchanging love that never ceases, that is new every morning, we worship you today, oh God. Lord, we don't come and thank you just for the little goodies we receive from you. We're not going to treat you like you're Santa Claus, God. That's, that's belittling you. You're good because of your nature. And you're loving because you are who you are. And we worship you for that today. And Lord, you're with us in the good times and you help us. And you're with us in the hard times. And you help us then. You see us through the waves and the bumps and the bruises of life. And Lord, our eye is not on the goal of just of the end of this life. Our goal, our eye is on eternity with you, O oh God. For this life, as you said in your word, is but almost like a blink of the eye. And it'll be over. But heaven will go on forever and ever. And we thank you for that. Lord, we want to be the people in 2014 that you want us to be. We want to be the church in 2014 that you want us to be. We want to spread the good news of Jesus the way you want us to. We want to live it so that they can't call us hypocrites and say you say one thing but you act like another. Lord, we're not going to go there. By your power living in us, we are going to live godly, holy lives. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But we're going to be loving. So that when people see us, they don't see just us. They're going to see Jesus as well. Lord, that's my prayer for these people and for my own life. Is that they wouldn't just see Brian, they wouldn't just see whoever. They would see something deeper. They may not even recognize you who, for who you are, but they'd know that there's something more there. Lord, that's what we want to happen. 
that they would see something, there's more there than just you, isn't there? Yeah, there is. It's Jesus. And he's made all the difference in my life. Lord, that's what we want to happen in our church. And we want it to happen not just in our church, but in lots of other churches as well, Lord. Some churches in town are very similar to us. Some are very, very different. We pray for them all, Lord. If they believe in Jesus is the Christ and he was crucified and resurrected, we're going to pray for him. We pray for the Catholic Church. Lord, we're a lot different than the Catholic Church, but I pray that they see lives changed and people come to know Jesus in a very personal way there. I pray that that happens. And you work through their priest and the good people of their church to see that happen, oh God. We pray for Chuck Perry, a pastor up at the Church and Sisters, our Nazarene church there. Lord, thank you for his... I think he's been there quite a few years, Lord, and, and work through him and the good people up there to make a difference in that greater sister's area for the kingdom of God. I pray that you'd give them great breakthroughs. Lord, you know just what needs to happen in that church. I don't, but that doesn't matter. You do. Will you help them move forward in 2014 in wonderful ways? as we want you to help us move forward in 2014. Be with our district superintendent as re he recovers from his shoulder surgery. Lord, I think he's doing well and he's coming along. He's going to want to push, and I pray that you'll hold him back, and he won't push too hard. Lord, you figure all that out. Be with Bud Pugh, Lord, his assistant, who I'm sure is picking up some slack while Dr. Reeder recovers, and just be with both of these wonderful men as they do your work in leading our district, Lord, in doing things that no one ch individual church could do by itself. Father, we just worship you and praise you today. I know there's stuff going on in some people's lives here. There's some people who are struggling with some sicknesses and some really serious things. There's some people here that have had some tests done and they don't know the results yet and they're kind of in limbo, waiting. There's all kinds of stuff going on in people's lives here today, Lord. We just entrust each one of them into your mighty hands that you would work in their lives in powerful ways. And most of all, Lord, they would know the peace of God that passes all understanding. That's my prayer. <laughs> Is it through whatever time of uncertainty or difficulty that someone's going through here today, that they would know that God is right there and the Lord is good. And you're going to see him through right into eternity. Lord, we're all going to be there someday. And we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you. As we come to communion this morning, Lord, we thank you for the cross. Lord, I probably say this just about every time we do it, but I, I, I need to hear it. If, I don't know if anybody else does. Would you help this not to be just some empty ritual or routine that we do once a month just to say we did it? I don't want to do that. I don't want that to be that way for me. I don't want it to be that way for anybody else here. Would you make these next few minutes as we receive communion meaningful and significant as a means of grace oh god as we start out this new year we want to be headed in the right direction oh god i can't think of a better way to start than by receiving communion and thinking about your death and your resurrection thank you for the Lord is good. And you proved it 2,000 years ago on a cross in ways that we'll never deserve. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace and mercy that you poured out on us. In your name we pray. Man, I need the ushers to be ready to help me in just a minute. The Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament. He commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and wine emblems of his broken body and shed blood. This is his table. 
The feast is for his disciples. Let all those who have with true repentance forsaken their sins and have believed into Christ unto salvation draw near and take these emblems and by faith partake of the life of Jesus Christ to your soul's comfort and joy. Let us remember that this is the memorial, the death and passion of our Lord, and it's also a token of his coming again. Let us not forget, folks, we are one at one table. When we come and do this, communion should bind us together like nothing else. We are one. We stop and think for a minute before we receive communion. When Jesus did this with the disciples, they were not really very much one, were they? But they got there, didn't they? And so can we. So the ushers are going to... I need, I need four people. And the ushers are going to pass out and uh, listen to this song. And just hold the communion until everyone's received and we'll take it together. Let's just make this a time of reflection. Go ahead. Down on what the Lord has done for us. Your feet, O oh Lord, is the most high place. In your presence, Lord, I seek your face. I seek your face. For down at your feet, O oh Lord,
bow your heads for a moment, you know, turn it down just a, a little bit more. I wanted them to play that song on purpose as we bow our heads this morning. Would you stop and think, what's the point of living? Just to earn a living for a while and get a house and get stuff and then die? I don't think so. And you don't think so either. I don't, I'm pretty sure of that. The point of living is down at your feet, O oh Lord, is the most high praise. When Jesus went into that upper room, nobody would, nobody would stoop to wash the feet of anybody. Nobody would humble themselves enough. Folks, Christianity is about humility. It's about humbling ourselves at the feet of Jesus. It's not about putting ourselves forward. It's about saying, you know what, I am nothing compared to Jesus and that doesn't mean we don't value ourselves or we think of ourselves as garbage because we're not we're made in the image of God but we humble ourselves before Jesus and we bow at his feet that is where the highest praise is folks and that's where you're going to be embraced by his mercy. Down at his feet. This bread that you hold in your hand represents his body, which he allowed to be broken so that your sins could be forgiven. Let's take and eat and be thankful today. And this juice represents his blood that in a figurative way washed away our sins as it flowed out of his body. Let's drink with grateful hearts today. Father, this morning, we come in all humility. You are everything. And we live to worship you. That is the point of life is to live to worship you. We bow at your feet, almighty God. There is no one great like you. Thank you that you embrace us with your mercy. We're not worthy, and yet you do it anyway. And we're grateful for that. Thank you, Jesus that you loved us enough to die for us. We celebrate that today, mighty God, with all humility and gratitude and praise and respect and awe for who you are. We worship at your feet today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Oh, you're already seated. That takes care of that, doesn't it? We're going to let the kids go to Children's Church. Off you go. And, uh, boy, I tell you, 
we have some uh, relatively new people in our church. You'll see me with a Kleenex all the time. Anybody that's been in this church knows that I'm a big crybaby. But I'll, I'll tell you, folks, and, and with all sincerity, and I know we've been over this a thousand times, when I think about how embraced I am by the mercy of God, and we sing great is the Lord, and we sing for the Lord is good, I tell you, that grabs me every time. Maybe I'm just an emotional person. No, there's no maybe about it. <laughs> I am an emotional person. But, and I don't, I'm not saying for a minute that you have to be like me. Please, 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 do not act like me. <laughs> but that ought to grab us. That ought to get a hold of us, folks. It ought to move us once again. If you're relatively new to our church, we're delighted to have you here. Um, I am a, a pastor, and I'm also a physicist and an engineer. Oh. <laughs> you're, not, you're not going for it, are you? I, I really didn't think so. Um, I was called a liar. Wow, that's really harsh. Man. It's true, but, but it's still pretty harsh. Um, no, I'm not a physicist, and, and, uh, and I'm not an engineer, but I did a little homework. We're going to talk about God's power this morning. You know how much power there is potentially in one gram of uranium? 20 tons of TNT. If we could unleash all the power that is wrapped up in one gram of uranium, we haven't figured out how to do that yet. The best physicists and engineers haven't got there yet. But they know if they could unlock all the power that is in one gram of uranium, it would be the equivalent of 20 tons of dynamite. One gram. Birthday candle. Probably about a gram, pretty light. If we could unleash the power that is in this candle, it would literally blow your mind because it'd blow up this room. And if you were in it, then it'd blow you up with it. We haven't figured out how to do that yet, but that kind of power, those physicists and those engineers that have all those PhDs and those really smart guys that I just kind of stand in awe of, they know that it's there. And it's true. So if God can put that kind of potential energy into one gram of uranium, what else can he do for us? What can he do for you? What can he do for me? You know, Billy Graham just celebrated his 95th birthday. He, he's pretty well done with ministry, but I'd say he's earned a break. But a number of years ago, he made a statement that I found, and I find it most interesting. And I'm not trying to be critical of anybody, okay? Don't take it that way. But I'm going to read you what he said. And I can't help but think that he's right. He talks about the church, and when he talks about the church, he's talking about the general church, not any one denomination or any one group, the, the entire church across the United States of America. This is what Billy Graham said. The church today is powerless. We are gathering for our prayer meetings, church service, Bible studies, etc., but we have no power because we do not have the Spirit of God in power and fullness in our lives. The Bible said, says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
End of quote. That's quite a statement. You know what? That's quite an indictment on the church across America today. I don't think I'm going to argue with Billy Graham. He's seen a whole lot more of the church across America than I ever will. So why is the church lacking in power today, folks? Well, when we talk about the church, what are we talking about? I'm not talking about the building. I don't care about the building. I mean, I do. We need, to take good, we need to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. But in Africa, I, I've seen places where church is meeting underneath a tree. There is no church building. They don't have the means to build one. So what's the church? Church is people, right? So if the church across America, if Billy Graham's right, if the church is powerless, that means that the people that make up, that go to all these churches and millions of people across America have got a power problem. We've got a power problem. We lack the power. I'm not saying we here in this room, the church across America, lacks the power that God means for us to have. I want you to, if you turn in your Bibles or your electronic device or whatever it is you have, to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to read a couple different passages this morning. And I know what time it is. So you better read, you better, I'm going to read fast. You better listen tight. Does that make any sense? No. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Verse 16. I pray that out of his... Now, Paul is addressing the Ephesian Christians. These are Christians he's talking to here. Not unbelievers. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he, he's talking about God, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now, I've heard a lot of people quote Ephesians 3.20, and I love Ephesians 3.20. Ephesians 3.20 is a great verse. Amen? Amen? You know, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, but they oftentimes, you, they, people will quote Ephesians 3.20, but they don't look at the verses that come before it. And folks, it doesn't work to take Scripture out of context. You've got to take it as the group of what it says. God is not able to do immeasurably more than we ask or we think unless we do what he talks about in the previous verses. Unless we have the power and are filled with the measure of all the fullness of of God. Now let's just back up for a minute and start at the beginning. The first step, of course, is being born again. I, we all know that. It's kind of like a Geico commercial, right? You say 15%, everybody knows that. Everybody knows the first step is you must be born again. Jesus said that to Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3. You must be born again. Nicodemus is going, what are you talking about? Jesus explained it to him. You've heard it before. It's the most important step a person can ever take in their life, to be born again. Jesus equates it with being born of the Spirit. I've used this illustration before. I know in private groups, I think probably in church. I'm going to use it again because it works. I want you to think of your life as your house. Just think about the house that you live in. Whether it's a nice house or not, I don't care. It doesn't matter right now. 
when you invite Jesus into your life, it's like I come and knock on the door and you invite me into your house. I'm a guest in your house. Jesus becomes, and he comes into your life, and he's a guest in your life. That's the most important step a person can ever take. There's no doubt about that. When a person is born again, it transforms their life. Being born of the Spirit means that that person comes into a relationship with Almighty God. Nothing more important you could ever do than that. But we are not called to just be believers, folks. We are called to grow as believers. Everybody knows that, don't they? Everybody knows that. But growing as a believer means taking another very important step. And that means... That second step is being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, the Bible uses different words for that. It uses the term sanctified. Excuse me, my nose is a little bit runny this morning, sorry. It uses the word sanctified. The Bible uses the word holy. It uses the word filled with the Spirit. If you look at that, do your homework. You can fact check me on this all day long, I don't care. If you look at those words, they're all the same basic root word, hagiosmos, in the Greek. It means to be set apart and to be purified. Set apart and purified. A very important step that needs to happen after you become a Christian. You can be filled with the Spirit's power. I've talked to so many people in 30-some years of ministry not just in this church. They'd say, Pastor, I just feel like sin has always beaten me up. Like sin has always got a hold on me. Well, it doesn't have to, folks. It doesn't have to. And you can say, well, Pastor, how do you know? It's not my words. Turn to Romans chapter 8 for a minute. Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. You can be set free. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I'm not saying you're never going to be making a mistake. But if you think you have to live under the curse of sin your whole life, and you're bound by that, then you need to read the Bible. It says you can be set free. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. You don't have to live according to the sinful nature. Don't let anybody tell you you do. Because that's not what God's word says. It says we live according to the spirit. If, I, I, I don't have time to read this whole thing. I, I, you know, it says those controlled by, in verse 8, controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and he, and he goes on from there. Folks, don't let anybody tell you that you can't beat sin. You can beat sin. And it's not because of what you do, it's because of the power of God working in you. If God has the ability to put 20 tons of TNT in a gram of uranium, folks, he can help you beat sin. You can beat it in your life. I've heard people say, I had a, a pastor, I won't even tell you what church he was in, it wasn't a Nazarene church, when I, before I ever moved to Florence, said, you know, we can't help but sin and thought and deed, word and deed every day. That's not true. Where does it say that in Scripture? The devil couldn't do any worse than that. We can, we can overcome this. Paul goes to pr on to pray in, in Ephesians that they would be filled with the fullness of God. Being filled with the Spirit and being filled with the fullness of God, I see is the same thing. 
In, in Acts chapter 19, you can look it up if you want, Paul goes to the Ephesians and, and he asks them about this matter of being filled with the Spirit of God. They don't even know what he's talking about. We've repented. We've, had, we've been baptized with John's repentance of, of repentance of sin. Paul says, you know what? You guys haven't got the full story yet. And he talks to them about being filled with the Spirit. It's this being filled with the Spirit that brings the power that Billy Graham believes is lacking so much in the church. I don't know if physicists will ever be able to convert one gram of uranium into all the power that's locked up in it. But I know that if we submit ourselves to God, if we humble ourselves at the feet of Jesus and submit our entire lives to him, that he can unleash power in our lives that we've never known before. I believe that with everything. I, I would quit if I didn't believe that. So you go back to the analogy that your life is your house. When you become a Christian, Jesus comes into your house. Okay, let's just use your imagination for a minute. Say you have me over for dinner. If you're nice, you might even invite Lorraine. <laughs> maybe you might invite her and then maybe me. If, 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 whatever. So how weird would it be if I came into your house and you had me for dinner, and we sit down at the dining room table, and uh, we eat dinner, and then I get up, and I go in your bedroom and say, you know what, you need to really clean up your room. That's disgusting. That closet down there, you need to clean that out. That, that's ridiculous. The bathroom, it's a mess. You would say, what in the, who in the world do you think you are telling me to clean up my house? You know what, that's what God does. He's not content to be a guest in the house of your life. When he comes in, he wants to control every part of your life. That does not happen when you first become a Christian, folks. The Bible doesn't say it. But you come to the place as a Christian where you need to surrender yourself totally and completely to the will of God. That means every nook and cranny of your life is committed to him. That means that Jesus gets to go into the attic and say, Brian, clean it up. And I have a decision to make. Am I going to yield to God's control or am I going to hold back? I've seen Christians that they're like in this tug of war. And they're not happy sometimes. They, they love Jesus, they want to serve God, and yet they're not willing to give up this or that or this or that, this attitude or that habit or whatever. And so they're in this tug of war, and they're getting stretched, and it's uncomfortable, and it's always going to be, folks, until you say the tug of war is over. And I submit myself completely, 100% to the will of God. That's what being filled with the Spirit is is all about. That's living up to the potential that God has planned for every one of us. You know what? I didn't tell you the truth about something. Not intentionally. I told you we were going to go back to Nehemiah to start the new year, didn't I? I was ready to plow into Nehemiah. I sat down at my desk this week, and boy, it was like the Lord showed up and said, Brian, oh no, you're not. I said, but I've already got this all planned out. I, I know where I'm going. I'm going to go to chapter 8, and, I'm going to, and, and I, I got a plan here, Lord. You know what? It's really stupid to argue with God. It just doesn't ever work. And I said, okay. And it was like the Bible fell open to Ephesians chapter 3. Brian, this is where you're going. This is how you're going to start the new year. Folks, I'm not judging anybody here today. If you're new to our church, I'm not judging anybody or anything. I don't know what's going on in your life. I, I'm not drawing any conclusions about any one person here. 
What I'm saying is this is what the Word of God says, and this is what we need to do. And you need to ask yourself if you've done this. Have you submitted yourself completely to the feet of Jesus? Down at your feet, O oh Lord, is the most high place. Down at his feet is the most high place. That's where you refine. Down at his feet is where you find great mercy. Not exalting yourself. Not in this tug of war. When God says, Brian, that attitude, it needs to go. Then I got to let it go. Brian, that habit needs to change then it better change in me or I'm going to be unhappy. A pastor of a church, I won't tell you who or, or what, but <clears throat> was really struggling. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was some outward success in his church, but inwardly he was in turmoil. He was reading the Bible and he realized that even as a pastor, he needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he'd never really done that before. And he was the pastor of a church. He took a piece of paper out, regular piece of paper, and he wrote on it all that he would give to God and the areas he would turn over to God, and then he signed it. And it was like the Lord showed up in one of the most dramatic ways in this pastor's life that had ever happened. And God says, wad that paper up and throw it away. What? I just said I'd sign over this area and this area and this area and this area. I might throw it away. And it was like the Lord said to this pastor, take out another piece of paper. Took out a blank piece of paper. Sign the bottom. Sign the bottom. Like the Lord said, I'll fill in the rest. I'll tell you what you need to commit to me, not you. I'll tell you, you sign the bottom, it's like signing a blank check. Do you trust God or do you not? The pastor did it. And he was never the same again. Folks, this is a simple message. This is not complicated. Maybe you said, yes, pastor, I've been filled with the Spirit. Have you renewed that lately? It's something we renew all the time. You don't live on last year's blessings or 10 years ago's commitments. You live on today's commitments. It's not that if you don't make the commitment tomorrow, you're going to go to hell. I'm not saying that. But every day is a new day. And everybody, every day brings new temptations and new challenges. And every day... Lord, fill me with your spirit today. Every day, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Brian is dead. But Christ lives in me, and the power I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what it's about, folks. We call it holiness in our church. I've had people say to me, oh, you holiness people are kind of fanatics. <laughs> I've been called worse. You know what, people, folks? We better be interested in holiness. You know why? Because if Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live at peace with all men, and to be holy without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's not Brian talking. This is what the Bible says. So somebody can make fun of my holiness all they want. I'll just point them to it, Hebrews 12, 14. We better be interested in holiness because without it, we're not going to see God. We're not going to see God. So let me just wrap this up. Not judging anybody. Not... Uh, Jumping any conclusions about anybody? Not doing it? I don't go there? What's going on in your life? What's going on in your life? Are you struggling? 
See, folks, this is nothing to be ashamed of. It's an important step that we need to take. Can you stand with me, please? Do you need, I'll just say it bluntly. Do you need to come to the place where you say, Lord, fill me with your spirit for this day. I surrender every nook and cranny of the house of my life to you today. I just wonder if there's anybody here that needs to do that. You're going to have more joy, more happiness, and more power than you've ever known if you do that, if you haven't done it in the past. Maybe you've done it in the past, but you need to renew that this morning. I don't know. I, I was really praying about how to handle this at the end. I wonder if anybody needs to come down here and just stand by me and just face me, and, and I'll pray a closing prayer with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to say your name. You're not going to have to say anything out loud. But you're going to pray and ask God to fill you with his spirit, and you're going to surrender every area of your life. And I'm going to pray as well. It takes a lot of humility to do that. It takes a lot of guts. A lot of us have already done it. I had to do it. I did it when I was 19 years old. A month after I became a Christian, I realized that I had not surrendered everything, and I had not let God sanctify me completely. And I did that at a big Nazarene church in downtown Eugene, and I, my life was never the same since then. Have I struggled at times? Yeah. Have I had a hard time? Yeah. Have I been perfect? Hardly. But God has had first place in my life. Anybody else need to just come down and pray? Surrender it all to Jesus. Down at your feet, O oh Lord, is the most high place. Humble yourself. I'm not going to wait long. We're going to pray here in just a second. If you just need to be filled, maybe you've done it once, maybe you need to do it again. Father, we thank you this morning that you have enormous power that you can unleash in us and through us. It's nothing we do. It's all about you. I thank you, Lord, that we can overcome sin. According to Romans chapter 8, it doesn't have to beat us. We can beat it. And we can defeat that sinful nature. Actually, you're the one that defeats it as you work in us and through us. As we surrender every part of our life to you, you give us power over doing wrong things. And I thank you for that. I take no credit, zero. Because I know what my life was like before. You get all the credit, you get all the honor because you've done all the work. And you provided for us on that cross in your resurrection that we could beat sin. And we don't have to live in that continual tug of war. The words that come out of our mouth can be pure and holy. Your word says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. The attitudes that reflect out of my mind can be good attitudes. The actions I do out of my body can be good actions. Lord, it's not because Brian's anything. It's because you're everything. And I give you all the credit. Would you make us a pure and holy and a power-filled people? It's the only way that we're going to really make a difference in 2014 in this community is as we're totally surrendered to you. Thank you, Lord, that you provided for that. Thank you for filling us, for working in these people's lives this morning, whether they're standing up here, standing out there, wherever, it doesn't matter. Thank you for this mighty work in our lives. We give you great glory and honor and praise. You get all the credit. You deserve the glory because you've done all the work. We give you praise for that. 
In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Bless you. Great to be with you. If you're new to our church this morning, wonderful to have you. Come back again. Love to have you. Bring me M&M's.